Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence at Luminance. Um, we'd just like to welcome you to this uh, beautiful evening. We hope that you enjoy it. Before I continue, I'd just like to welcome Dr. Judy Lamini up to the stage. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I'm very happy to see there are a few gentlemen here, because though the book says smart women, I've read it and uh, it works for my son as well as it would work for my husband so <laughs> uh, sylvia walker is highly skilled and experienced in financial services industry having spent a large part of her career as a marketing manager for a blue chip company during this time she worked closely with the media conducting hundreds of presentations doing radio and tv interviews and writing many articles for publications such as o uh, the Oprah magazine, uh, I remember when it first came, I actually always waited uh, to actually see what's in it and uh, read your advice in it. Uh, Good Housekeeping, Hoye Hayes, Holding Surrey, The Mercury, Plus 50, and many others. She left the corporate world at the end of 2014 to pursue her interest further afield. She's also a published author she contributed chapters on financial planning in Mary Ann Shears, uh, Take Control, The Natural Way, and Nadia Bilchik and Lori Milner's Own Your Space. She authored Dealing in Death, uh, Ellen Parkins and the Community's Struggle with Tick, where she actually informs people of the problem with substance abuse. And uh, it's actually quite an informative book, uh, you know, which uh, I thank you for because we have such a problem with drug abuse. Steeped in blood, the memoirs of Dr. David Latzo, which was a shortlisted uh, book for the Alan Payton Award in 2011. Uh, congratulations again on that. She also co-authored and published Reflections for Old Mutual in 2013. Sylvia is currently a financial planner, which actually informs her authority in the subject. Um, she actually, her latest book is Smart Women that we are about to launch today, which was published this month. So it's hot off the shelf, uh, choosing Women's Month to celebrate them by giving them information, uh, which is a culmination of many years of experience in advising women on how to gain financial freedom and grow their wealth. What makes this very important to me uh, Sylvia actually asked me to read her book and review it before it was published. So I met Sylvia before I actually met her physically. I met her through the power she has in the information that she spreads, uh, empowering women mainly, but men too. And uh, when I read the book, I actually said, we have to launch this book. Not only should we launch the book, but we actually have to sell it from our store. And I'll tell you why this was important for me. Because one of the things that drives who I am is actually gathering knowledge in whatever shape or form. If you look at our country currently, almost every week you read about a woman that has either been killed or abused, more often at the hands of someone that is actually intimate with the woman, that she trusts. And I've actually had the encounter with many different groups of women. And one of the two things that I truly believe will liberate women and allow women never to allow anyone to abuse them in any form is love for yourself and owning your own money. Because some of these women, some do have money, but they don't love themselves enough. They sell their soul. Because when you allow someone to abuse you, you've actually sold your soul. You've lost yourself. And you don't lose yourself if you love yourself. That's one part of it. But once you've done that, you empower yourself with knowledge. Because when you empower yourself with knowledge, then you empower yourself financially. 
It's funny how the power of knowledge enables you to fend for yourself. Because if you can fend for yourself, you won't be enslaved to anyone. So this is very important to me, uh, Sylvia. That's why I actually said, please uh, come and address the Luminance team. Uh, before I sit down, just a few housekeeping things. One of the hats I, may, I have, actually I wear, is Future Nation Schools, Sifiso Learning Group. My love and belief in education has actually, which is mirrored by my husband, has actually informed us forming a group that actually empowers through education, which is private quality education, which we started beginning of the year. One of the things that we do, which we started last year, is to host an annual conference, uh, which actually empowers the mind. For the first time this year, we'll host the book fair. And we'll have different people, different authors uh, from the continent who will actually share their stories, uh, will share their books, and the people will have access to these uh, authors uh, to actually interrogate them. And uh, the topic or the theme for this event is decoloni decolonizing the mind, which is very important. So before I sit down and call upon Sylvia, who actually has all the wise words. Uh, I just want to thank my team who put it all together. Uh, the PR and marketing team led by Claire, thanks Claire. Uh, assisted by Tulani and Teresa, thanks guys. Uh, Bunola, the store manager, we can't do all these things without you. And thank you for looking so beautiful and gracing us with your presence, Sylvia. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. And um, I'm from Cape Town. And I don't think we have shops or stores like this in Cape Town. Not where I hang out anyway. So this is one of the prettiest places I've actually ever been to. It's lovely to be here tonight um, and to actually just talk a little bit about my book. And you know, the, it's the weirdest thing when you write a book because you spend weeks. It took me about three months to write this book. But you spend weeks alone in your, in your mind, you and your computer. And when it's finally out there and people start reading it and they start actually saying, wow, this is quite good. And it's, it's almost a surprise because it's, it's so internalized within you. So it's fantastic to be here. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background as to where I come from. Um, my sort of outline resume that Judy read kind of gave a brief overview. Um, but who am I? Where do I come from? And why did I do this? And, and what is this thing about money? You know, why do I? Why am I that concerned about money? Because money is part of our lives, isn't it? All of our lives. And I actually love when I do workshops. I do a number of workshops and and and, and uh, sort of keynote presentations. But I like to ask people, and maybe I should ask it here. But who in this room has got enough money? <laughs> <sighs> Nobody. <laughs> Okay, so the point is, the issue actually is it's not about how much we have, but what we do with it. And that's really what my message is about. So who am I? I grew up with a mother that was a single mother. So I grew up with ever, never entering into the frame of mind that there will one day be a man to take care of things. I had a mother, a strong mother, and it was financially that was my, my perspective that I saw. Grew up, got married, had children. I'm divorced. I got divorced a number of years ago. So I'm a single parent. I've raised my children. Um, so I have that perspective from a personal, from a personal level. Um, so it's, as I say, it's never, I've never had that mentality or that thought that actually there's going to be somebody to rescue me or bail me out. I've always jokingly said, there is no plan B. I am plan A, plan B, plan C. There is no other. I have no, no safety net. Okay. I think there are a lot of women like me. There's a lot of women in other situations, but they're a lot like me. So that's just a sort of personal view. Um, from a career, yes, I finished at UCT and you know, you know, towards the end when they all come, all the companies come and they a career day and they come and sort of proposition themselves to you and try and get you to come and work for them. And I got job offers from Woolworths and Old Mutual. And Old Mutual were offering me, I think it was 50 Rand a month more than Woolworths. So I took the job for that simple reason. <laughs> but you know, it's another valuable lesson I've learned in life is that the universe actually it was meant to be because I had such a strong uh, belief and, and belief system and value system around money. I had saved for four years to buy my first car. Um, and going there, it wasn't a case of just, it became an extension of myself working there in that industry, in the financial services industry. And I was very blessed because after I got quite itchy, I moved around a lot. I was in the marketing area. I was a marketing manager. And um, at one point I got very itchy and I said, I really need something new and challenging. And they said, you know what? We want to start a focus on women. 
we believe that we need to focus on women uh, around financial issues and it's an untapped market. So here's a big pot of money, as they do in corporates, which is wonderful. Here it is, go and research, go and focus on the space. And that's what I did. And I, that's where I worked with the Oprah magazine. I, we had, it was fantastic. It really, I was so blessed. We ended up, I mean, I went to Chicago, I was in the audience of the Oprah show, met her. It was just wonderful. So not many people get to do that in their careers. But, you know, after about eight years, we had a new senior management. And as anyone who's worked in the corporate space knows, one thing that is certain is uncertainty. We're restructuring, pulled the plug. No more focus on women after eight years. So you know that joke where they say, you know, when you're climbing that corporate ladder, you've got to make sure your ladder's up against the right wall. My ladder was up against the wrong wall. <laughs> but it actually didn't matter because I had learned so much and grown so much. And I then stayed around for another year and a half or so. They gave me another job, which was really didn't work for me. And I then took a package and I left. And I left saying I'm going to carry on doing what I did and what I love doing. And that is sharing knowledge, sharing information, empowering people, men as well as women, but my tendency is towards women because my heart lies with women, but empowering them, sharing my knowledge and information, and then also getting myself qualified as a financial advisor so that if I need, if somebody wants advice or specific help, I can actually do that, that next step. In that time, before I left Old Mutual, I had met this woman, Ellen Puckies, who murdered her child, um, and I just, I like to talk about it because it's actually quite a, it's something a lot of us in our sort of lovely leafy suburbs don't want to think about. You know, it's a problem that exists down there, other side of the world. She strangled her child, and he was a 19-year-old tick addict. And she strangled him, meaning to kill him. It, it took some effort. Um, he was lying down. He wasn't upright, that you die quickly that way. I have a bit of a morbid curiosity with crime. You must forgive me. <laughs> so anyway, so she, she killed her child. And I was just, my interest was around the fact that why would a mother kill her child? We, are, we nurture our children. We do everything for our children. So this book was an interesting exercise in that I looked at the, the Cape Flats, the issue of drugs. Tuck was never a big issue in Joburg. It took off in the Western Cape. Here I think you had other stuff like heroin and mandrax were bigger problems here. But I looked at those kind of issues, how the apartheid system had actually caused and created the townships that existed when they moved people out of the inner city and it caused these huge poor areas with gangs and how the gangsterism and the, the illegal trade in drugs and so all of the social issues that went behind it. Um, from there I then moved on to Dr. David Klatso's book, Steeped in Blood, and then I did the book for Old Mutual. So I did a number of books and I was doing all of this while I was doing my job as a marketing manager at Old Mutual. And many people said to me at the time, you do all these talks, you should write this down, you should write a book for women about what you're sharing. But that's another lesson that I've learned in life. Life gives you what you need to have when you need to have it. It doesn't happen always when you want it to happen. And I had to take a bit of a detour, and I must tell you too, I have written, I, I mean, I've written a couple of proposals that didn't work. The one which I was very hard sore about was Tandi Makubela. I did a proposal, I was very interested in that case did a proposal, and there's a lot of work. It takes about three months worth of work to do a proper proposal for the publisher. And they came back with, oh, they're not quite sure. They hummed and hard, so I left it. Um, I did a proposal on the arms deal, which I'm so thankful the publisher said no to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was working with a man who, who yeah, had, had worked very hard in Danelle, and the more I got into it, the less it interested me. So that was the universe helping me out. Um, so I've done a few. So, you know, you don't always get success the first time. That's what I'm saying. And I had to go this roundabout way and eventually leave the corporate space, um, take a year actually out and do all kinds of other things, renovate my kitchen and whatever. And then I got my thoughts together. And about a year ago, I said, OK, fine. Let me see whether there's an appetite for this. Do people really want to hear this message? So I did a proposal, went to three publishers, and one said no. One, I'm still waiting for a reply. And the third said yes. So the one that said yes, it was a go. And I literally then, they gave me the go-ahead in November last year, um, early November, and there was either the option to have it done by February and it would be published now, or to, if I wanted to take longer, it would be published next year. But my impatient nature is that I said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it now. So I did. Spent three months and I wrote it and I did it. And actually, I learned a lot. I knew a lot when I started, but I learned a lot. And I'm, I think, like you, I'm a bit of an infophobe. I love researching. I love information. So I learned some interesting things, like people with money are happier than people without money. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> 
So I said this yesterday. I've been doing a few of these launches, and then a lady came up to me afterwards. She says, you know that thing that you said about people with money are happier? It's not really true, you know. I thought, oh. <laughs> I know you would know. And anyone who's done a talk, when someone comes up to you and tells you what you said wasn't true, and then they give you like 10 minutes of why not. It's, yeah. But anyway, they did research in America, and they found that people who've got money are happier than those with, not without or those with less. Why is that? Because if you have money, you can use that money to buy life's experiences. Time with your children, holidays. Um, it's not stuff. It's, they've proven stuff doesn't make you happy. Buying things and items doesn't. But experiences make us happier. And if you have extra money, you can afford those experiences. If you are just living day to day, battling, paying your bills, you haven't got that spare cash. So you are less happy. Okay, so that's the one thing I learned. Another thing that I learned, which is actually also quite a controversial thing, is that staying married is better for your wealth long term. Did you know that? <laughs> Getting married and staying married is better. The University of Illinois, they've tracked, in, uh, they've tracked uh, couples about, I don't know, it was about, I don't know, how many thousand couples? They tracked them over like 10 years. And they tracked their wealth and, and, and how they progressed. And those that stayed married ended up wealthier than those who got divorced. So I've always known this intuitively. I've, huh? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> yes, I do add a big caveat to that. Of course, that's not a reason enough to stay married. But it's an interesting thing. And as I say, I've known that instinctively because if you look at, if I've looked at just people I've known, when you get divorced, everything gets split and you've all got to, you've got to start again. Two sets of expenses, two households. So that was another interesting thing that I learned um, along the way. Okay, so that was kind of how I got to this point of, of, of writing this book. And as I say, I, I learned a lot and I had, I had quite a bit of fun along the way. Another thing that I kind of delved into or dipped my toe into that I've not known much about is the whole thing of money, your money personality. So just as we all have personalities and we all got different, we all are different. I mean, this is an obvious statement. But we've all got a different way of looking at money, so-called money personality. And it actually can cause huge conflict in a relationship. And many people can attest to this, that you may view your money very differently from your partner. And I always encourage people that, you know, when you're getting married, you must actually sit down and talk about these things. But of course you don't, because it's just the other person who walks on water. It's the most wonderful person. It's just perfect. You know what I'm saying? It's always perfect in the beginning. Then after a while, these differences start to surface. And if you don't address them, they can become huge issues. Because everyone's perspective is always right. I'm always right, right? I'm right, you're right, we're all right. But by talking about it and acknowledging those differences, you can actually work through them, as opposed to it causing major conflict. So I did some research around, there's no South African personality profiling, money personality profiling assessment. There's nothing in South Africa. So if anybody's in that field, and I actually did, I tried to find a psychologist or someone that I could work with, but I, I didn't manage it. So I'm using something from New Zealand, from Liz Coe, who runs Money Max in New Zealand, with her permission. She was incredibly supportive and generous and said, use my assessment. And I actually use it in my workshops as well. So it kind of puts people into one of four pockets. You're either a hoarder, which I'm pretty much that, so I like to hang on just in case. Um, you're one of those people that's quite entrepreneurial, so you invest to actually grow your wealth. Um, you may be somebody who likes to wear the badges of success, so you blow it and you don't care. You, you know, you, you, you get those that blow it and don't sort of care because it's always going to come back. And then you get the ones who just, it's all about the badges of success. It's all about the now and looking good. So what does that do? That actually helps you to understand your approach towards money and it helps you change your behavior. Because I think anybody who is interested in reading a book like this or wants to know more about money wants to do it because they are unhappy. They've got some issue around the way that they're managing their finances. So why, what is this whole thing about being smart? Smart women quite simply make smart decisions around their money. And not so smart women make decisions that make them poorer. That's as simple as it is. Okay, so we make a lot of decisions that actually make us poorer, that take us backwards instead of taking us forwards. Some of those include, um, have you heard the expression fake it till you make it? Have you heard that one? I got into hot water about this two days as well. Somebody also said, no, you're wrong. I said, okay. But I'm not really wrong because I know I'm right. Um, <laughs> I'm always right. The thing is, if, you, and if you're doing a job and you are doing the job and you're proving you can do the job, that's fine. That's okay. But when uh, people start spending money on stuff and dressing the part and having the car and having all the flash stuff, but they actually haven't, can't afford it, that's when there's a problem. 
And I always say jokingly, you can fake yourself right into the insolvency court in your like Gucci, with your Gucci handbag, or whatever it is, designer brand. You can be standing there, the best dressed in the insolvency court. So fake it till you make it is a thought, I say that tongue in cheek, but it's a thought that actually makes us poorer because we think we need to look the part before we are the part. Another thought that we often have is that um, if I can afford the repayment, I can afford it. So how many times have you known people who want to buy something, they don't ask what does it cost, just how much is it per month? Oh, okay, it's 500 rand a month, I can afford it. So that's fine, if you, but if you keep doing that, you could find yourself in serious hot water. Okay. Another one, an example is if I want to, I want to save money long term, I must put it in the bank. Okay, that's a thought that's definitely not going to make you wealthy because banks give you security, but they don't actually give you any kind of good growth long term. Right. So there are a number of those thoughts, and I cover some more in the book, but that goes around thoughts that actually make us poorer. So what are smart thoughts? Okay. As women, our money is one of the pillars of our lives. That's how I view money. So our lives are, and we, as I say, we don't jump out of bed in the morning thinking about money today. Only like very few people do that, and it's not very healthy to do that. But li we live our lives. We love our lives. We have our families, our experiences, our jobs. We have everything to live in life. And money is but one element. Our money is one of four pillars of our lives. We have our financial side of our life. We have our relationships, our spirituality, and our health. And those are the four pillars. And when we have balance in those four pillars, we are fairly comfortable in our lives. If you neglect one of those aspects, you end up then with a problem, and you then need to focus on that. So somebody, for instance, let's say who is um, a complete workaholic and always just working and working and wanting to build money and wanting to make money, will neglect family, maybe neglect their health, and that will eventually backfire on them. So I see money as part of, as I say, as part of our life in terms of those four pillars. Then as we travel life, as we go through the road of life as women, we have many things happen to us along the way. Many, we, you know, we get married, we have children. Some of us have children without getting married. Some of us get divorced, some of us get retrenched, some of us, whatever, things happen. Money and our financial well-being is the foundation upon which we travel. I firmly believe that. If your money foundation is solid, doesn't matter what happens in life. You can cope with everything. Okay, but if you're just going through life blindly, you just, oh, you know what, we're just carrying on and we just hope everything's gonna be okay and, you know, the secret. Did anybody, did anybody fan of the secret here? <laughs> okay, did it work for you? <laughs> it worked, okay, I'll talk to you later. Um, <laughs> now, I'm just fascinated by the secret because at the time it was this, I mean, they must have made millions out of it. But it was like, you can just, the universe will provide. And the universe does provide, but you've also got to put a bit of effort in, you know? It's like one, you can't say like, go to sleep at night and please universe make me thin tomorrow. It's not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to put the effort in. So being smart is making clever decisions along the way. When you get married, get married the right way because the way you get married, and I don't care how wonderful the man is, but the way you get married is the contract between you. And if something goes wrong, that piece of paper is all you've got when the chips are down. And show me one divorce that's been nice where people say, here, darling, you have this and you have that. Doesn't happen, huh? You, you fight. So get married right. If you are getting divorced, make the right decisions at that time around your money because there are huge financial implications. Um, it's also a case of, and when we talk about being smart about money, it's also a case of smart women having balance between today and tomorrow, realizing today is important, but tomorrow is also important. And that's a mistake that a lot of people make because they just live for today. It's all about today. It's all about spending, looking good, looking right. You know, I always say jokingly, like on Facebook, I mean, social media is fascinating. It really is. You do never, you'll never post on, on social media, I have three million rand saved towards retirement. Hey, you're not going to put that there. No. But you can put in there your new lounge suite and your holiday and whatever. You can put all of that on there. So we live in a society where it's what we show is what we are. Okay, and that's fine to do, and you can have it all today and do it all as long as you can do it tomorrow as well. did a workshop a few months ago, and there was a woman there. She was in her sort of late 40s, and she just a year or so ago started a job. I got a salary. She used to consult before the time, so she was the first like salary with you know firm income. And when I said this and spoke about this, she said, oh, but you're wrong because like I've got a good money now. I like to go to concerts, and I like to enjoy my life. I said, no, that's fair. It's a choice you make. If that's the life, you know, that's great. I said, and then we spoke a bit further and we started talking about retirement and property. And, and she looked at me and she said, oh, but the house that I own, that's my retirement plan. 
So I said, okay, well, here's the problem. Okay, you can live the life today and go to the concerts and spend all the salary and, and have a good time. Your house is not your retirement plan. If that's your retirement plan, there's something wrong with your picture. So it's about creating that balance for today and for tomorrow. Another, which I actually mentioned in the book, I met a woman a few, a few years ago, and she actually said to me that her mother and father had been married for many years. Her mother was a housewife. The father had, you know, worked. And he was very frugal, the old man. And she always wanted to travel, her mother. She always wanted to just go overseas. But they didn't even have domestic help. She did all her own, her own housework, raised the children, absolutely everything. And then the father died when the mother was like 80, 80 or 81. The old man finally died. And they found out he had millions. He was like really, really wealthy, stashed away. So he was obviously one of those people that was so fearful, always just worried about tomorrow, and it was a miser today. And she said the irony was, of course, her mother was now too old to travel and enjoy the money. That's also very, very sad. So life is about living, but don't do it at the expense of tomorrow. Because what's waiting for us tomorrow, ladies? Do you know? Okay, old age. <laughs> First menopause. Now, you know, life expectancy has increased tremendously over the last 100 years. So I say the, 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 the benefit we get for that is menopause, you know. That's what we get for it. So at about 1900, we were dead. Ladies were dead at around 40 or so, 40, 40, 45. Today, into our 80s, into our 90s. As financial advisors, the, the, the tool that we use, the system we use to do analysis for clients, works on women's life expectancy of 93. Oh, that's a bit hectic for me. It's a bit depressing for me to think about 93. But the point is, we're going to get really, really old. And at some point, we're going to need to have cash um, to actually have, to live, to survive in old age. All right. So that's, if nothing else, you need to build long-term wealth for retirement. If there's no other reason, it's really just for that. Um, another smart choice that we can make is in just in terms of our spending. And I, I must share the example of the car because I'm quite, it fascinates me if I look at the cars people drive. Now, I know this is Joburg and I know there's a lot of smart cars here. And I'm sure a lot of people here have got smart cars. But look at, listen to my simple example. Um, the difference, every 100,000 Rand you borrow when, you, when you're paying off on a car is an extra 2,000 Rand a month, okay, roughly, at current interest rates. So the decision between buying a car for, let's say, 200,000 and 300,000 is an extra 2,000 Rand a month repayment. If you bought the cheaper car and took that 2,000 Rand and invested it, it would be a very clever thing to do. Because a car is simply a steering wheel and four wheels. That's all it is. <laughs> That's all it is. I know one feels really zhuzh in a really zhuzh car. I've got a rental car at the moment. <laughs> and I must tell you, the chap here helped me to get some books out of the car just now, so we went. So he's like, where's your car, where's your car? I said, no, it's this one here, this little guts and go. He's like, I'm looking out for the Ferrari. I said, no. <laughs> I said, no, I talk about money. It wouldn't be a Ferrari. But the thing is, so seriously, so there's, anyone who studied economics would know there's a term opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of you buying that more expensive car? If you take that 2,000 Rand and you invested it, over 20 years, you would have about 1.4 million Rand. If you discounted it for inflation, you'd have about 600,000, so in buying power. Okay, it doesn't sound 600,000, you may say it's not a lot of money, but it's 600,000 you wouldn't have had. You would have just burnt it up driving a car. So there are lots of examples like that where the way the decisions you make when it comes to your spending can ha will have an impact on your long-term wealth. And people always say, I don't have money to invest, huh? my life is expensive. In fact, this morning, a woman said to me, she, well, not, she said to me, what is the financial independence? Do you tell people what, how to get a second and third job? I said, no, I don't, because that's another trap we fall into. We think we need to earn more and more and more. But you know what? Do you know that Sha Shaquille O'Neal, the American basketball player, yeah. do you know that he was reputed he blew a million dollars in the first day of being appointed to the NBA? This is the story. Some sources say the few, a few hours, others say a day, but a million dollars. Okay, he bought his mother a house, and he bought him like a Ferrari, and he bought a couple of things. You know, he spoiled the family. But his manager phoned him and said to him, if you carry on like this, you'll be bankrupt soon. So the thing is that if you, it doesn't matter how much money you've got. If you don't know how to work with it, you will never have enough money. So it's not about just generating. It's about working with what you've got. So a large part of the book talks about that, is about finding the money, making those smart decisions. And then, of course, how do we invest our money? Where do we go? There is so much information out there. Um, and every time you, 
you know, you go onto your computer, there's people advertising, you know, you get these like so-and-so bought a flat in Manhattan, you know the story, or <coughs> invest in this or invest in that, and, and you know, we'll make you a millionaire, you can triple your money, this clock made 50,000 rand in two weeks and all of this stuff, okay. And all of that's quite enticing. But I can tell you one thing, to build wealth long term is quite simple, okay. It's a simple formula. You need to spend less than you earn and you need to invest it correctly. Now, as simple as that is, it is difficult. The spend less than you earn is that all of those decisions we make, and as I say, make those smart ones so that you can use your money more productively. Investing it wisely is understanding how money is made and how wealth is built. Because if you don't understand, and the guy comes along to you and he says she's got this great idea and you must give him your money and guess what, you'll be rich soon. And you give him your money and you're yet another Ponzi scheme victim. Happens all the time. And every time people say, oh, they were so stupid. And then people fall for it every time. And it's tragic. There was a woman in the Western Cape, um, Anisha, I can't think of her surname now. She shot herself earlier this year in January. A 40-odd-year-old woman shot herself and the one son, the other son, was out. And nobody could understand why she committed suicide. Her husband had died like a year ago. Um, she was working. She seemed to have got over it. They had a nice home. You know, she had her life together. And then it turned out that she had invested her husband's pension money in a Ponzi scheme that was going under. So it can have tragic consequences if you don't have a knowledge base to work from. So when you invest your money, there are basically four places you can invest, four ways to, to make money, to invest. Number one is on the stock exchange, okay, the JSC, through shares, through equities. Read an article the other day where they were saying the Johannesburg Stock Exchange has been the best performing stock exchange since 1900 worldwide. It's delivered the best value, which is phenomenal. How do you access the JSC? You can go and buy and sell shares yourself, okay? You can go and sit and that's quite stressful and quite traumatic and you need quite a lot of knowledge. You can access it via unit trust fund. So we all together, instead of all of us each buying shares individually, we put our money together and it gets, when it gets invested. Basically, the shares then are put up and put in baskets, and we invest as individual investors into those unit trusts, and the portfolio manager manages that for us on our behalf. Okay, and that is often the route a lot of people choose. Problem in South Africa, of course, is about a thousand unit trust funds, so it gets a bit complicated. But that's a very good way to to access the equity market. Another way that you can access the equity market is by going to a company like a financial services company. A Sunlum, Old Mutual, Liberty, MMI, and you actually pay a premium every month and they invest on your behalf your funds onto this, this, the stock market. Okay, So equities long term gives fantastic growth. You know that you've seen the JSC All Share Index graph. Hey, it does up. You've seen that. Up, down, up, down. So it's very volatile. But the point is long term it moves in an upward direction. So that's equities. Then there's also money market, what's called money market or cash investments. That's your bank account kind of investment. So it's very safe. You give the bank your money. They tell you, we're going to give you back, let's say, 5 or 5.5% interest. And so you know your money's secure. Obviously, with equities linked to this, the equity market, it's not secure because it's based on shares and, you know, and the movement of the markets. So with money market or cash accounts, it's very safe. But you, your interest that you get is probably less than inflation. Yeah, that's why it's a thought that actually makes you poorer. Because inflation at the moment, I think, is somewhere between 55 and 6%. It's good, though, for short term because it gives you access to your money. Remember, you also always need to have an emergency fund. So it's good to have some money invested in some liquid investment, but it's not long term going to get you to where you want to be. Then there's properties, of course. One can look at property investments. Um, and there, your house that you own is not your investment for the future. Okay, simple. It's good to own your own property because rental, it's, it doesn't make sense to rent and make somebody else rich. I mean, there's this expression that said landlords grow rich in their sleep, which they probably do. But you need to have other, if you want to invest in property, other forms of property investment. So it's either through using the bank's money, which is a brilliant idea if you can get them to lend you the money. They lend you the money, you buy a property, you rent it out. Okay. You may find in the first couple of years you need to subsidize that because you may not get enough rent in to cover your bond and whatever. You need to do your calculations carefully. But after a couple of years, you'll break even, maybe a year or two, and then you should start making a profit. And as I said to somebody this morning, also sort of challenged me on this one a bit, I said, once you start making that profit, invest that profit. Don't blow it. Invest it. Make your money multiply even faster. If you don't want to be hassled with all of that stuff, with being a landlord, which a lot of people don't, you can invest through the property index on the JSC. 
So there you invest in specific shares that they are through uh, commercial, they manage commercial properties, companies that manage commercial and industrial properties. Also delivers very, very good return long term. Okay, so there's property. And then the last uh, form of investing, which is a bit more fun, I suppose, is in art or in Krugerrands or in diamonds, if you know anything about diamonds. And it's not, not illicit ones that you, you know, put in the soles of your shoes, but diamond trading. So... That, I mean, Kruger Rands have delivered very good value over the long term. And I often say, like, when a child is born, you know, it's a lovely thing to give a child. A Kruger Rand is a, that newborn baby as a gift. And when that child is 21, what a wonderful legacy for them to have. So instead of buying disposable nappies or whatever, buy the child a Kruger Rand <laughs> or a half a grand or whatever. Yeah, think, think clever, make smart decisions. So that's the other form of investing. And we don't really, it can, as I said, it can be so confusing. So as individuals, in, you know, investors, we need to decide... Are we going to do it ourselves? Because you can go on the internet, you can go and have a look and see, and you can play around and do some risk assessment tools. Or are you going to sit down with an advisor, with a person, and have a relationship with that person who will look at your overall plan? Because you obviously also need to protect your wealth. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that in too much detail, but you need to make sure that if something happened, if you lost your income, you could survive. So that's also a very personal decision. Am I happy to do it alone, to make my own investment decisions, or do I need someone to hold my hand? And sometimes it's helpful to have someone hold your hand, because if you're doing it alone and you decide you don't feel like doing it anymore, you can just stop. But if you've got someone there, like a coach, almost like a financial coach, who's there and meeting with you regularly and, you know, it's not so easy to just say, I'm stopping this now. Um, I, you know, I'm not interested anymore. So, yeah, that is kind of it in a nutshell, I think. Um, I just want to leave you with one last quote from M. Scott Peck, The Road Less Travelled. I don't know if anyone's read the book. I read it many years ago, and, and there was one thing in there that jumped out at me, and it's resonated with me, and I've actually, I use it all the time. He says that life is a series of choices and decisions. If we accept that we will be forever free. If we don't accept it, we are forever victims. Now think about that. So often in life we encounter people who are victims, right? It's the fault of my upbringing. It's the fault of the government. I mean, geez, if I put one, see one more Facebook post about that, I'm also going to cry. Um, I just scroll, I scroll, I scroll, I scroll. I can't, I can't cope with negativity. So with face, you know, it's the fault of the government, it's the fault of my neighbor, it's the fault of my boss, it's the fault, of, it's always somebody else's fault. But the point is we make decisions and choices all the time in our life, and there are consequences. So never mind the ones we do on, a per, on, on other as, as aspects. My knowledge base is around money. Decisions we make around money will have consequences later on in our life. And if we make decisions that aren't so great, we need to live with those consequences. We can't be a victim and say, I didn't know. It wasn't my fault. And that's really what I want to encourage you to do, is to find the information, get information. Knowledge is power is one thing, but knowledge is with, without action is also useless. Okay, just one last word of warning before I sit down and keep quiet. Ponzi schemes. How do you spot them? Somebody asked me that this morning. Okay, number one, anybody who wants to take your money must be registered with the Financial Services Board. Okay, FSB. Ask them, are you registered? If they say yes, say, show me the piece of paper. If they won't show you the piece of paper, go to the FSB on the website, email them and say, is this person registered? If they're not registered, run away. Because everybody, all financial institutions have to be registered with the FSB and it gives you some kind of backup as well if something goes wrong. So that's the first thing. The second thing is they must have a website, a building, they must have something, okay? They must produce something. Money doesn't come from nowhere. So just be very wary and very cautious in that, yeah, they must have a website, they, well, they must have a building, they must have a business, and they must be registered with the FSB. So don't, don't lose your hard-earned money that way. It's, just, it's, a total, it's a total shame, and it's an, absolute, yeah, it's an absolute sin. So that's about it that I've got to share with you. I don't know if anyone's got any questions they want to ask. Um, yes. after a very long time. Oh, okay. I think we have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so would you still consider property to be a good investment other than um, getting property management companies, so as an individual? 
It all depends on where you're buying that property, and you need to do your you need to do your homework carefully. You do. Um, I looked at the the APSA property index. They track property prices in South Africa, residential property prices, so for like the last thirty years. So I included some numbers around that. Um, and and you know, property does beat inflation, not by as much as what equities do, but it's an it's an average. So I don't know so much about the property prices here, but I know in Cape Town, people in the city bowl, I have friends and it's ridiculous. They bought a house in January last year. They're in Devata Kunt, which is there near the stadium. They bought a house for 3.4 million rand. They're now selling it for six and a half million. It's insane. I mean, I said to them, who can afford to pay six and a half million? Hello, for a house. No, it's all the foreigners coming to look. I said, it must be. It's no local person. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody, I mean, what? But the thing is, so it all depends where it is. I think some areas, escalate very quickly and others don't. So it's very difficult. To, you just need to do your homework and, and understand the area, where is it going, what, you know, what can influence future prices and so on. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the great insights. Um, I'll definitely consider the Kruger rants for my future children. <laughs> um, one question that I have, I work for a media company, and the one show that we have just introduced recently is about Bitcoin, and everyone seems to be very excited about it. And you mentioned um, if someone doesn't have an FSP, it's mm. a sign of um, they might be scamming you, but there is a lot of people still who say that they have made a lot of money through Bitcoin. What is your view on that? Okay, I think I'm gonna start saying every time someone asks me that, I want like five rand in the jar. <laughs> okay, the, the issue with Bitcoin, and, and I have, I've, I've, I'm, I am researching, I have been researching it. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people. The problem with Bitcoin, on the plus side, it's just been rocketing. So people are making money with Bitcoin. The problem from a traditional financial services perspective is it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into our box of tricks. You know what I mean? There is no, there's nothing backing it. So what is driving its value? Why is it increasing in value? What I've been able to gather, it's increasing in value because of the increase in online in e-commerce in, in the rest of the world. Here too, but in the rest of the world. So that's making it more valuable. But that's, it's not a commodity behind it. You know, if you have like currency, you can actually exchange it for, there is something backing it. If you have a Kruger Rand, you can exchange it for gold. Bitcoin, there isn't anything. Nobody owns it. So if you invest in Bitcoin and it goes, it crashes overnight, who do you go to? So it doesn't tick the boxes, it doesn't fit in the traditional way. So I cannot say to people, invest or don't invest, I really can't. I even contacted ASISA, which is the Association of Savings for South Africa, in South Africa. They're a body that basically works with the financial services industry and with consumers around issues, investment issues. So I've, I know one of the policy advisors quite well, and I emailed and I said, what is ASISA's official view on Bitcoin? And I got the same reply, we don't know because it doesn't fit in with anything that we know or understand. So I, I can't say to you do it or don't do it. Um, I've known, I know some very intelligent people, financially savvy people that have invested in Bitcoin. But I can't, yeah, I can't vouch for it, unfortunately. Either way, I can't. Sorry, short, short non-answer to your question. <laughs> well, yes. I'm not sure that I need the mic. Um, thank you. I really appreciate you starting out with the personal touch. That really kind of drew me in. Um, if you can't hear, I have an American accent. Wouldn't so. <laughs> And I appreciate you bringing in American examples, too. Um, so I have a two-part question. So the first part is, if you were doing this talk in the US, would it be the same way? Or would you change it in any way? And the second part, second part of the question is, if someone wanted to think about investing globally or internationally, what do you think would be like the best way to think about uh, investing in a global way? Sure, OK. The first question, in terms of if I was doing this in America, um, I would have to just see if there was any differences in terms of the legislation there around tax and that kind of issue. So I think fundamentally the issues are the same, but there may be some different nuances around, um, you know, the tax and interest rates and that kind of thing. So if that answers that. International investment, you can access that. There are companies offering international investments, direct international investments, um, and then of course you can access it, as say, via the financial services industry as well. Of course, investing internationally hinges on the fact that the rand will get weaker. I mean, that's so it's a, it's a kind of negative hope investment, if I can put it that way. And just on another personal level, I've reached the point in my life where I cut out all negativity. That's why I say on Facebook, I scroll, scroll, scroll. I just can't cope with the negativity because I think life is just too short. Um, but so foreign investment is about the rand weakening, um, and so then you, obviously you will you will do well. So 
a very important part of your portfolio too, I would say. Not everything, not all the eggs in one basket, but I didn't talk about diversification. I mean, I'd be, I can be at 12 o'clock talking, but yeah, you need to also diversify. So good idea to have some money yeah, in foreign investments. Yes, there's a lady at the back there. Um, good evening. Yeah. Um, I am um, a mother of two young kids, and um, they've just recently started school. And as a mother, we all want our kids to go to the best schools. And obviously, best schools cost a lot of money. So I am conflicted in a sense that as much as I want them to go to a good school, um, would it not be better if I take that 6,000 rands per child and invest it for the child? God forbid something happens to me in the near future, or can I continue to let them go to the school? What then happens if in the next five years I am unable to afford that? So You're a single mother, you said. No, I'm not, oh, not? Um, okay. but just in case. Okay, now just because if you were a single mom, there's obviously a greater risk if something happens to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're investing in your children at the same time. That's also a form of investment. So sending them to a good school is investing in their future. So I, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't do that. Um, but hopefully you would ideally be able to do that and have some put some money aside for yourself. I didn't talk about pay yourself first. I forgot all about pay yourself first. I think I think it was Oprah who first coined that phrase. What is it? You know, it's quite simple. When you get your salary, do we, most of us earn a salary. Well, some of us trust fund babies here. <laughs> <laughs> trust fund babies can leave the room. When you when your when your money's about to come into your bank account, then your creditors are all lining up, aren't they? Yes. They're all lining up like this with their hand open for their slice of your pie. Okay. Yes. If you're going to put yourself at the back of that queue, there's never going to be anything left. So I put Sylvia right in the front, and I've done that for a very long time. I put me right in the front, and I pay myself first. And guess what? You do survive. You do manage to come out. You can do your budget. You can cut down here, cut down there. But if you make that decision and make yourself a priority in the front of that queue, you will end up building long-term wealth. And it don't have to, people think, you know, it's only for rich people, for people with money. Doesn't, you don't need to start with a thousand rand a month. If you can start with 200 rand a month, it's something. It's better than nothing. So keep your kids in the school. It's an investment in their future. See if you can't put yourself in the front of that queue and, and actually just put something away for yourself every month. Okay. Yes, another one here. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matsuka. And uh, my question is, I've, I run a small business. I want to know how... Would you, you say start with yourself. How do I start with myself as Mutsoka to invest money from my business? Because, you know, with a business, you've got all these expenses, the staff and everything. How do I take a chunk from that for my own personal gain, but for an investment? So help me if I'm wrong here, but often the problem when you're starting a business is your finances and the business finances is just one big web, yeah. one mess. It's all the same. Okay. Yeah. And actually, it was funny, I did a talk a few weeks ago to a group of entrepreneurs, and there was a lady there with a very similar question, and she was saying, because I said, you know what, you should actually be putting money aside for yourself first and foremost. Put yourself in the front of that queue. And she said, yes, but what happens if I can't pay salaries, or, you know, I, I need that money to make my business, keep my business afloat? And actually, my reply to her was, if you can't pay salaries, there's something wrong with your business model. It shouldn't actually impact on your personal financial well-being. You need to make it a priority because long term, if that business didn't work or something went wrong, at least you've still got a bit of security. Mm -hmm. But if it's all tied up in that, and it's a mindset, it's really just a decision that you make. But if it's all tied up in that business and something goes wrong, you're leaving yourself in a very vulnerable position. People often do that. You know, they leave corporates and they take their pension fund and they start a business. It's a, it's a common trend. And it's very risky because if there's something happens, as I say, they've lost that financial security. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I think what I want to find out is, you know, I was sitting with my financial advisor yesterday where I want to take some money from the business into like a unit trust of some sort. But from a tax point of view, I'm still struggling on how I'm going to juggle all of that. Okay, so you've got spare cash in the business that you want to actually invest elsewhere. Yeah, but for myself. For yourself? Yeah. But then you'd have to draw it. You can't just take it. Business doesn't work like that, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> you, you have to, I mean, it has to be a legitimate business expense, so, yeah. So why don't you just pay yourself a bonus? You can do that, surely, and invest it. That's what I would do. <laughs> Hi, 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Nontlandla. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, going back to the issue of buying shares, what's more advisable, uh, flying solo or like coming with, like doing it as a group of women from the JSA? Okay. Um, yeah. So I would say if you want to, if you want to buy shares, you need to first get yourself on a good course. Okay. First thing, because you got to know what you're dealing with. It's a very complex place. It's a very risky environment. So even if you were a group of women investing, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to lose everybody's money. So that's the very first thing. So either way, get yourself a good course. And there are some very good courses offered on how to invest in the JSE. Okay. There's actually a chap that I know. He wrote a book. It was published earlier this year about making money. Ross Larter, was a guy from Cape Town. I actually met with him and I spoke to him. And but his whole thing is about like, quick wins. You know, it's almost you know, like predicting where things are going to go. And it's like, and it goes against my own belief in that growing wealth is a long term process. So, um, but make sure if you do a course that you actually find one that teaches you an, an understanding of what drives the value of shares. But failing which, take your money individually or collectively and invest it in a unit trust. Then there's somebody else managing it on your behalf. You don't have to stress about it. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I'll beat you to it. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Sylvia, for taking this opportunity. Um, so my question is, is actually sort of related to hers, and you sort of answer it because I was I wanted to know what factors does one look out for in, in terms of uh, investing in unity trust, particularly in this uh, volatile climax and political instability in our country. Okay, so to that, and again, this is Miss Sunshine coming out. We've always had instability in South Africa. I think this is a country that's probably had very seldom stable periods. Um, and it will be here in the future, the instability. So, and people have invested through thick and thin, and they have made money through thick and thin. So this volatility and inst political instability and all of this stuff, I don't believe, is anything unique or new. Where to invest? Um, Normally what happens is you would do some kind of risk assessment. So either if you sat down with an advisor or if you went online, there would be some questions asked of you and that would determine your appetite for risk. So basically how much risk can you take? Some people are, I'm a bit conservative, so I get a bit jittery if my stuff doesn't look so great. You know what I mean? It starts losing value. Other people are, oh, it's fine. You know what? It's a long-term thing. It doesn't stress me. Again, it comes back to our internal personality and drivers. So you would do some kind of risk assessment, and it would then determine how much risk you can take as an investor. But also as a rough rule of thumb, the longer you've got to invest, the more risk you can take. Because, as I say, equities, which is probably where the bulk of investments sit, the equity market is risky. It's, it's, you know, it's very volatile. So... Um, yeah, it depends on your, your risk assessment. But I can tell you as an advisor, um, and I say this rather tongue-in-cheek, I mean, I've sat with clients already, and we've looked at, like, at different investment portfolios. And sometimes those with a less risky sort of um, structure deliver better value, long-term growth, than those with a more risky structure. There's no exactness in it. But it comes down to your level of comfort with risk, and that would then give you an indication as to where to invest. Um, okay, I had you mentioning art, yes, and um, I did a course in art and business, and the first thing that they said is that art is not liquid. Art okay. is not? Liquid, yeah. Okay. okay. Liquid, no, it isn't yeah. liquid. Yes. Not at all. Um, so, um, well, have you seen how has um, art in Africa and African art performed? Um, I know that, um, I mean, it has to be a very long time for you to to um, have return on an art piece that you buy. Um, but I'd like to hear from you, how have you seen it perform in South I'm not an South expert Africa. at all in art. Art and diamonds, I'm not, I say that in the book too, go find yourself someone who knows about diamonds. And art, I'm not an expert. Um, and I, that is me too, I'm not gonna pretend to be something that I'm not. What I will say is yes, art is a long-term investment, um, but it also is a thing of beauty. So it's not just, you don't buy art just from a financial perspective. You also buy it to admire it. And of course, art, though, has quite a lot of maintenance that needs to go around it. It's an investment that needs to be taken care of properly because it's, it can be damaged. It can, you know, it can lose value by being damaged. Um, I wouldn't say it should be the cornerstone of an investment portfolio, but it can form part of it if, if, that is, if you're so inclined. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer. <laughs> 
But if you give me your details, I can always do a bit of research and let you know. <laughs> I'm an art advisor. Okay. So. <laughs> You're an art advisor. So you should be able to answer your own question. <laughs> It definitely has to be understanding and fully being into the presence of being selfish with myself, investing in myself more, investing in my own education, investing in my kids' education, and not always thinking about the third person investing in things, but also investing in myself, that's also very important. That's an investment on its own, and that's being a smart woman. So, um, I think it's just basically to, um, accountability for my own financing and uh, being responsible for my own money and then also having a longer term of view in terms of investments, especially in terms of investing in shares like the JSE. And then also, I think the other thing that I'd also like to have more information on is in, in terms of Africa rather than just uh, South Africa. So that's another thing that I'm going to be researching on and, and hopefully acting on it. So, yeah. My name is Noma Kuku Masubu. Um, think about investments more, do my homework, and try and make more money and spending less. That's exactly what I'll try and do. I, I always budget, and one thing for sure is I always try and pay myself last because I think that everything else is important. Uh, although I do love pampering myself, so this, this has just given me justification to pamper myself first before everybody else, so uh, I'll, that I'll take from, from the talk, definitely. My name is Pearl Zwane and the changes I'm going to make after today's talk is to stop spending so much on luxury items. I have a thing for shoes, so I think I have enough at present and maybe start investing the money that I spend towards the shoes. It's important because if you don't have parameters and you don't know what needs to get allocated to what, then you'll just overspend and won't even have enough for the most important things. And then you'll have the repo guy coming to collect your car because you didn't plan properly. My name is Fatima Joyce. I'm actually from a mining industry where after listening to Sylvia, and I definitely will read the book, and I'd like to share this book with a woman in mining in Pumalanga because uh, I'm actually one of the guest speakers every time they have the forum. But what, what I'm actually thinking and what I know for sure, this book and her talk is definitely going to change me in terms of how I spend my money and how I should look forward to spending my money. And um, it's really going to educate me so much more that I'm going to be very, very wary in, in terms of uh, spending my money and not spending what I don't have and looking after what I need to have in terms of retirement. My name is Debbie Edelstein, I'm from a company called Quality Life Company and I've been involved in women's empowerment, leadership and entrepreneurship for many years and I so get what Judy said right up front is that there are two things we need to do as women. We need to have self-esteem and we need to take control of our own finances and I think that Sylvia's book has come at a perfect time. I have no doubt it will soar and I, I look forward to actually not only reading it but to helping you spread the word Sylvia. I think it's a very important message and I wish you only the best. Hi, I'm Cheryl Nondumiso Sabane. Um, being a smart woman basically means you are financially savvy, financially smart. Um, you take care of yourself first and you are able to take care of your family, uh, but not for the now. You're also focusing on the future. Um, I think I learned a lot today um, in terms of being financially smart because there are certain decisions that we make as women, um, assuming that um, you know it's easy because we also have partners that we financially save. But um, I even like the idea when she said, um, just because you can afford something, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know that's your financial freedom. So. Um, I look forward to reading the book and empowering myself more and making smart financial de decision as a woman moving forward. Hello, uh, my name is Dara Nguyenge and I'm out at the Smart Women book launch. One of the things that have been reinforced um, in terms of this book launch and just kind of being a smart woman in, in my personal view is that 
is, is independence. I mean, much like Sylvia Walker, I grew up in a home where I was raised by women, my grandmother and my, and my mother. And one of the things that stood out for me is how she's never looked to the next person for any financial dependence and especially to another man or to, to, to a male figure and, and that's been reinforced by her upbringing and looking up to financially independent women and that's one of the things that have been reinforced for me and it's one of the things that I truly believe in. So being a smart woman for me is being independent financially and in all aspects of life. As from today, I'll, first thing I'll have to love myself to make sure that I prioritize um, things that I want in my life and in terms of like um, saving and focusing on my future, make sure that um, I live for today and for tomorrow in terms of investing in my future and for my kids as well. My name is Nicole Coward. I guess the question that's been asked to me is what a smart woman or what being a smart woman means to me. Um, I'd say the most important thing is that you can be an educated woman, you can do what you're supposed to do, you can go to school. Being a smart woman means listening to yourself, listening to your values and acting accordingly. And if you can combine the two of those, then you have freedom. Mm -hmm.